Welcome everyone to the 12th episode of Trow Talk Live, brought to you by the Master Gardeners of Ottawa Carlton. My name is Penka Matanska and I'm the moderator for today's session. The presenter today is Kelly Knoll, a long-term member. She will talk to us about the Japanese beetle, an enemy of so many gardeners, and she will talk about one of the Japanese beetle's enemies, the winsome fly. Kelly loves to garden and has hand squished many Japanese beetles in the process, usually, but not always while wearing gloves. If you have any questions, you can type them into the chat and Kelly will answer at the end. Another of our members, Odette McIntyre, is standing to ask those questions for you. Over to you, Kelly. Thank you, Penka. So, Today we are going to talk about the Japanese beetle and the winsome fly. I'm sure if you are a gardener, you don't really need any introduction to this guy, but here he is, the Japanese beetle in all his green and copper metallic glory. The um, Sitting at this point, I think on one of his favorite foods, probably a rose. I'm going to give you some information about this bad guy, some science-y type stuff. It, it is an insect because it has three pairs of jointed legs and it's three parts to the body. It, it's a beetle because it has uh, two sets of wings. The, these copper colored um, elytra, as they're called, are actually wings, hard wings. And it has spiny legs and it has lamellate Lamellate antenna. Now that's this thing up here, like little club-shaped things on their antenna that make them even more sensitive. The, this creature is the Popilia japonica, the Japanese beetle. And as many beetles are, it's quite colorful, quite easy to, dis, to see. And its distinguishing feature that makes it uh, different from other uh, metallic -y green and copper beetles. I don't think we have many more of them, but there are others. These little tufts of hair are the, the distinguishing feature that tells you this is the Japanese beetle guy. It's about 15 millimeters long and 10 millimeters wide, and it feeds on many, many, many plants. Introduced accidentally into New Jersey, uh, it was first observed there in 1916 and tracking back to where they think uh, it might have arrived from Japan. They, it was a shipment of bulbs in 1912 to this particular nursery. And ever since then, it has been spreading north and west and south. At, at first they launched this incredible chemical warfare on it, which didn't work, didn't really slow it down at all. And uh, they it, still treat them with a lot of chemicals or try to, and they have very, very careful inspections of any products that lead to make sure that they're not have any, don't have any of these guys on board. This is its life cycle. It, it, it is a, an egg for a couple of weeks, then a larva for about 10 months, most of the year. It's a pupa for another two to three weeks, and then an adult for just four to six weeks, which is starting now. Usually they show up for around here in the, at July 1st, which I think is a sort of an insult to come out on Canada Day, but anyway. But um, one of our Master Gardener friends told, told me she saw some today. So not surprised because we've had a bit of heat. So uh, that's when they emerge. They crawl up out of the solar. The female, and they feed, 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 feed. The females actually burrow down into the soil every so often, up to about eight centimeters. Now, that's, that's about three or four times their body length. Like my finger is about eight centimeters long, and they burrow down into the soil. They lay a few eggs, maybe one, maybe as many as five. And then they crawl back out and eat and mate and go back and lay more eggs. Um, they figure that um, they'll make many, many trips and may lay as many as 50 eggs in uh, a one lifetime, which is the lifetime is when they're on the wing, which is those four to six weeks. The eggs hatch 
pretty quickly in about two weeks. And then the larvae, which are grubs, uh, uh, feed on the grass roots. And when they're small, they don't uh, do as much damage. They get bigger and they get bigger and bigger and do more damage. And then as the temperatures cool off, they go back down into the soil, uh, which means that they have a better chance of surviving. Although apparently quite a few do um, freeze. Then they start, when the soil warms up again, they start uh, coming back up and growing again, molting again. And then they pupate the, this capsule right here, which lasts for about another two weeks. And then they emerge as a full-fledged beetle and crawl up out of the soil. And that's what's going to be happening now and practically has all, may have already started. This is what they do. They, this is why they're such a scourge. They feed on so many, many different plants. A lot of insects are specialists. They feed on one kind of plant and if they don't find that, they starve to death. But the beetles, they have favorites, but they will eat just about anything. And, and what they do apparently is the, the process of feeding and their own natural scent creates a, a sort of beacon for other beetles that may be anywhere nearby that they saying, I have found in something good to eat, come and join me. An individual beetle doesn't do all that much damage on its own, but when you get a bunch of them, they, when they congregate, that's when they can be so damaging. And this is what they do. They eat all the nice thin parts of the leaf. They skeletonize it, taking out all that, um, everything in between. Roses are one of their favorites. I had a personal experience with a rose bush that I could see from a distance and I thought, oh, that's interesting. It's a nice yellow rose. I'll go look at it. Oh my God, I was horrified. It was absolutely covered with beetles. They were inside the leaves, burrowed into the um, buds. Oh, and right beside it was a small Japanese, uh, not a Japanese lilac, a Korean lilac, one of the miniature ones, didn't have a single beetle on it. They do avoid um, thick leaves. And they prefer something that's easy to eat. They avoid rough leaves, hairy leaves. They don't like to feed in the shade. They, they come out to eat when the sun comes out. They go hide somewhere at night. I have not been able to find out where they go, but they go somewhere at night. They don't come out on a windy, coldish, rainy day. They stay hidden. But as soon as the sun comes out, there they are. I've had that experience myself of being in the garden and uh, on maybe a slightly overcast day and uh, suddenly the sun comes out and the next thing you know, there are beetles. Like they emerge from, I don't know where, nowhere. But now we're seeing them with these white blobs on the thorax. And what are these? Well, now we meet the winsome fly. It is a parasitoid. A parasitoid is an insect that lays its eggs on or in another insect. And then the larvae, the eggs hatch and the larvae eat that host from the inside out which kills it. Here's some details about this winsome fly. It's an insect also, um, but it is has only one pair of wings and it has different kinds of mouth parts, sucking, piercing mouth parts. So it's a, a fly in the order Diptera. And this particular one is in the family, the Tachinid flies. And the Tachinids are all parasitoids. This one specializes in Japanese beetles, so we call him beneficial. There are other parasitoids, there are other kind of flies that attack things like the monarch caterpillar, which makes us think that one's not so beneficial, but it's still just doing the same thing as this one does. And I have no idea exactly how to pronounce this name. I've tried everywhere to find out. Um, I call it Istoketa. Aldrichai. So you didn't hear it from me. If you find out it's pronounced some other way, 
Okay. It also uh, comes from Japan and it was intentionally brought here. Uh, in the 1920s, sometimes it says 22, sometimes 27, in an effort to control this, this beetle, uh, the beetle. Uh, it has also one generation per year. It emerges usually in late June and it feeds on nectar for a couple of weeks. And, but it only lives for about four to five weeks. The eggs are laid on a beetle. The beetles usually, well, it's best when the beetles emerge slightly later than the flies, because then the flies are ready to lay their eggs when the beetles emerge. And that's the best time to get a Japanese beetle, maybe still a little groggy from uh, just emerging from the soil. The, uh, now this particular um, fly, it lays, it's a, it glues the egg onto the, the thorax of the um, beetle. Other uh, tachinids burrow in and lay the egg, but this one just glues it onto the surface. The egg, and that one blob is one egg. The egg will hatch and the larvae burrows in through that uh, beetle casing, burrows in, and um, starts feeding in there. And I read in a couple of places that it only one uh, egg will hatch. If there were three eggs on it, um, two of them are wasted. The first one in gets the beetle and that's it. Now, then what happens is the beetles get weak. They're being eaten from the inside. Um, their flight muscles are um, affected and they drop to the ground and burrow into the mulch of the soil a bit. And basically they die. It takes about five weeks, five days, I should say, for them to die. And the maggot pupates and just stays in there, nice and comfortable for the entire winter, waiting, waiting, waiting to emerge next June. It just is quite comfortable in the case of that beetle. The, um, Here's, here's an approximate uh, comparison of size. The, uh, as I said before, the Japanese beetle is about 15 millimeters long and the, the little winsome fly is about five millimeters long. The uh, fly is a good flyer. The Japanese beetle, not so much. It has wings and it will fly, but they're clumsy flyers. They, uh, they fly aimlessly, as they say, unless they get that scent of um, somewhere feeding, some other Japanese beetle feeding successfully somewhere and they will follow that. Um, but this is what happens. The um, little winsome fly catches up to a beetle and gets its ovipositor on that thorax and it glues on an egg. Now, a lot of times if the if the fly is near, the beetle will startle and it will evade. It will, instead of flying away, usually they just sort of drop. Um, uh, sometimes when I'm trying to squish one, if I don't sneak up on it right, uh, just as I get my hand there, it drops out of sight. But uh, in fact, what often happens, since they spend an inordinate amount of time mating, the little winsome fly takes advantage of that because apparently when the Japanese beetles are in this process, they are focused and they do not startle and run off so easily. So that little fly gets its ovipositor in there and lays the eggs. So a lot of the infect the beetles with that are infected with these eggs have the blobs on their uh, thorax are females because they're the ones that are sort of pinned down and easily uh, accessible. I read that in several places. So the this tachinid fly, this winsome fly, was introduced in the 20s in New Jersey and the project was considered a failure. But what happened in fact was that the, the um, Emergence of the beetle and the emergence of the fly were not in sync in that area. The, the beetles came out too soon. Um, the flies weren't really ready. And um, so there probably were some that were in, had the eggs laid on them, but not that many. But now many years later, uh, they have been observing, the, the winsome fly survived. I guess it found enough beetles to uh, 
parasitize. But many years later, they are finding these more and more. And there have been some situations where they have caught some beetles that have been parasitized and brought them in and have tried to, um, they've observed the larvae there, but I'm hoping to get it to hatch so they could see what is this? Is this a wind supply or is it some other parasitoid that we are not aware of? Um, the, uh, they finally, in one case, they did a DNA test on the, um, because the, their efforts to get it to um, hatch didn't work. Maybe because obviously the uh, tachyna needs a period of cold rest before it is hatches. If it rests in its host all winter long before it pupates and emerges. So they did a DNA test on these larvae and they did find out that they were in fact uh, winsome flies. And you can uh, see these egg masses, they're pretty easy to spot. Now I'm not talking about today, other things that you can do about this, other natural predators, ants will feed on them, ground beetles, there are beetles that will eat the eggs and eat the grubs. If you have an infected lawn, raccoon, small, they will dig it all up for you and, and get rid of a lot of those grubs, which is a good thing. And uh, there are even birds that feed on them. Um, I put this down here, but there are traps that you can um, get that have that pheromone smell that the beetles like and are attracted to. But generally these are, these are considered not to be such a smart idea because it's like putting a beacon, unless you can get your neighbor to put it up somewhere at a distance from you, because um, it's a beacon that says to beetles, come here. And often these traps are um, get full quickly and the beetles arrive, they can still smell it, they can't get in, so they just eat your roses or whatever. So my new rule, and as I said, these eggs are easy to spot. If I see a Japanese beetle with eggs on its note, I do not squash it. I, uh, other people dump them into soapy water. I'm a squisher. And um, I also heard somewhere that um, the smell of a dead beetle or a squashed beetle is also something that attracts other beetles or deters, I should say, not attracts them, but deters other beetles. And I don't know whether that really worked. Anyway, that's what my information is today on the Japanese beetle and the winsome fly. If you have any questions, maybe I can answer them. Thank you very much, Kelly. This was so informative. Loved it. Um, well, I, I haven't received any uh, chat uh, questions yet, but uh, we do have, I do have some other questions that we've had uh, in the past. So um, the winsome fly is kind of an interesting insect. And I'm kind of wondering if you can buy uh, win some fly insects or eggs or something at garden centers in the same manner as you would buy nematodes or ladybugs? At this point, no. I, I looked that up because I wondered and no. But uh, the interesting thing that I forgot to mention is that um, the first confirmed sighting of an insect uh, of a winsome fly was in 2014 in the Pian here in, here in Ottawa. Okay. And uh, some in Montreal and I think 2013. And one of those pictures, let me go back. I didn't mention this and I should have. <laughs> this picture uh, is a real winsome fly that was taken last year in Sandy Hill, just a little bit west of me right now. Oh, no, wait a minute, east of me right now. Hmm. But no, you can't buy them yet. But you never know, maybe... If this turns out to be um, very successful, if more and more of them are more and more Japanese beetles are being uh, killed this way, maybe it will happen. Right, right. Very good. I guess we can try that. Um, or maybe it's a business uh, idea for someone. Um, <laughs> I have another question. And uh, so we, we hear about integrated pest management and you know the three pillars and, and, and all that of uh, integrated pest management. Do any of those techniques uh, work with like, um, like is making your rose bushes uh, stronger, like, you know, with compost or is there anything that we can do from the integrated pest management angle? Uh, not that I'm aware of. My strategy in that case is not to grow any rose. 
Uh, For most of us, with uh, most of us home gardeners, ordinary gardeners, we have a fairly small patch to look after. And if you are on patrol, uh, now that I know that there's some emerge today, I'm going out right after I finish here to see if there are any around here. Once Mm -hmm. you know that they have started, then the earlier you go out and get rid of the ones that are there, either knock them into a jar of soapy water squash them which is what i like to do or just uh don't let them uh, be on your roses sending out signals to all the other beetles around to here's here's a rose come and come and eat with me um so act immediately right yeah of course we don't use um pesticides in in, uh, when you read about controlling the japanese beetle in, in the states there's a long list of chemicals that they throw at these things uh, I don't know whether it's really as any more effective than just being vigilant and squashing. It's like the lily beetle. If you have lilies, you'll be familiar with another bright little. And there's a, also a, um, a parasitoid insect that has been released to lay its eggs on that one too. Maybe we'll get rid of it as well. Right. Okay. Yes, um, we do have a question here, and it, uh, the, I'm going to read it to you. It says, uh, does applying nematodes to the lawn help? Is this, uh, uh, or do the beetles just move in from the neighboring properties? Oh, of course they do. And I'll tell you what, um, the, the Japanese female, the Japanese beetle female is quite choosy about where she lays her eggs. She likes um, a nice, lush, well-irrigated, lawn um she doesn't like tall grass so the the good thing to do is not water your lawn in uh, july and early august and keep it fairly tall and and go over to the neighbor who is fussing over his lawn and making it nice and uh, lush and wonderful for her moist um you know they have to burrow in so it's not easy if it's a brown patch of grass They'll go somewhere else. But uh, if you apply the nematodes at the right time, then yes, they are especially effective in the uh, not long after the eggs have been laid and the little small um, grubs are starting to feed when they're young. That's when they're very vulnerable. So an application in uh, late, late July, early August, that's probably the best time. Not such a good idea in the spring when these are, these grubs in the spring are robust big guys and uh and the nematodes like to work in in the warm as well so it's probably best in august this is a good time okay i have a couple more questions uh i guess we still have time um okay so i've heard once i don't know if it's true but um somebody was discussing uh the the portion of the cycle what's that's happening in the grass obviously And uh, they were advocating that if we planted mostly perennial ryegrass in our lawn versus the fescues and the Kentucky bluegrass, um, like those two species being like ice cream, apparently to, uh, you know, to um, our our friends, the beetles. So is there any value to this, you think that? um, Well, the, the, um, the value is more in the, the condition of the soil if, if it is hard and dry, the, that beetle is going to go somewhere else. She's not going to be successful in laying her eggs there. And long grass, as I said, she doesn't like that. Um, it's, it's hard to say what is the best thing to do if you want to have a lawn. That's one of the reasons why they are not a big pest in Japan where they are native. And that's because the, um, the percentage of the properties that are covered with turf is small. Um, so that's enough to keep the uh, population at a, a size that uh, doesn't really bother us. It's like June bugs. The June bugs are a native beetle for us, and they come out in June and they do them some feeding, but there's never enough of them to, um, at, at least in my experience, to, to do a considerable amount of damage. Mm-hmm. And here's another thing I, I found out that um, the the beetle has, this Japanese beetle has one generation per year, but as it gets farther north, they're expecting that to change to, to one generation in two years. 
they're expecting the grub to spend um, two years underground rather and not be ready to emerge after the first year. It's like the Japan, the June beetle it takes three years to grow to a size where it can emerge. So they think that as it proceeds farther north, um, that may be the effect of that. Hmm, very interesting. Um, I've got a couple more questions. Um, so this, I've heard that uh, a thick layer of mulch can deter um, the bugs from uh, laying eggs. Is there any truth to this? Uh, well, I, I'm guessing that the beetle is smart enough to know whether it's in mulch or in soil. Um, and they, there will be some that do lay their eggs in a, a cultivated garden area. But generally, the observation is that they, the, the, she goes off looking for lawn, for turf, for short grass, nice, nice, as I said, nicely irrigated that she can burrow in. She has to get in quite deep to do this work and it's fairly exhausting. Sometimes they don't emerge for a couple of days after that effort, apparently. Oh, I'm sure it's, if the soil is hard, I'm sure it's not easy. So that's, uh, that's helpful. Um, one more question that I have is, uh, so apparently to deter grubs, so Japanese beetle being one of the grub um, individuals, um, I heard that uh, turning your lights off, you know, and closing your blinds, your window blinds at night uh, to prevent them from laying eggs in your lawn, like attract, apparently the lights attract the bugs, attract, um, so have you ever heard anything like this? Is there any truth to this or is this? No, in fact, uh, everything I have read, and I just sort of went off onto a rabbit hole of Japanese beetles in the last couple of weeks, um, the females, uh, they, they work on, they go down uh, to the grass in the sun when it's warm and they burrow in. Uh, they're not, what you do if you shut your blinds at night, <laughs> if you have an infested lawn, you won't see the raccoons and the skunks. <laughs> <They're not laughs> it up. You'll see what they've done in the morning, but you won't see them because they generally uh, do their work at night. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just I had heard that uh, they had uh, kind of matched the areas that were infested by the grubs to the shape that the lights were creating, right? From the windows, maybe, or from like some people have uh, stand uh, standing lights in their their front lawns or the backyard or whatever. That's interesting. It's possible because I know that uh, everywhere thing I read says that the beetle likes to work in the sunshine and the light. And so maybe you can confuse it by having a brightly lit, right. something brightly lit and uh, it will do it at night. I, I have not, that's kind of interesting. I wonder. Yeah, I have one more uh, question and this one is about um, uh, insecticidal soap and natural uh, insects, insecticides like neem. And do you recommend the use of those? Um, um, I guess, natural methods of controlling insects? I don't know. I, I cannot say right away that neem is um, approved in Ontario for that. Um, no. I know what I did once. Um, I don't know what I should say this, but anyway, I went into my house and I got my can of uh, Raid that was intended for use in the house, So, which you're allowed to do. And I sprayed a section of my um, Virginia creeper, which had uh, quite a few beetles on it. And they, you know, in a matter of uh, minutes, they were just dropping, as they say, dropping like flies, but I'll <laughs> say dropping like beetles. And uh, so, um, no, I, I just didn't have the patience to, uh, to squish all the ones that were on the, Jab the Virginia creeper. I, I said, okay, you can have that. And, um, I have uh, eat the daylilies at all. They sat, they stretched out on them for mating purposes on the colorful blossoms, but they never left any damage behind. Anyway. Ah, very good. Well, that's um, uh, I, I just, questions. Penka, back to you. Uh, well, I see some raised hands here, but I think we're out of time. Um, I'm not sure if we have time for one more question um, or um, I, I don't, uh, Judith and Marin, 
they have their hands up. I assume they have more questions. I'm not positive. The um, only reason my hand is up is because chat has been disabled for me. Right. Um, I don't know why. Uh, I was just wondering what your opinion was of the uh, idea of planting pelagoriums around uh, your plants. Is that a deterrent or a myth? Well, no, it's not a myth. Um, they they are attracted to the pelargoniums and they will feed on them and it paralyzes them and they drop to the ground. But the observation apparently is that it's a temporary thing. It, it sort of stuns them somehow and they recover. It doesn't seem to kill them. And, and they do like it. They do, they do come after the pelargoniums, the annual geraniums, as they're usually called. So that's what I've read. Now, at this time, I would like to thank Kelly for the lovely presentation, very informative, and Odette for the very interesting questions. Uh, and I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today. And please join us next week for the big, bold, and beautiful with Nancy McDonald.